The rest of us, let's take our Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Many of you may have gotten the news this morning. There was another um, a tragic shooting down in Orlando this morning. And, um, and, and I, there, there may be some, not necessarily in this room, but maybe some that might be tempted to, to say, well, you know, it was a, was a gay bar and, and here these, you know, there was at least 20 killed, I know, and there's 40 that had been injured. Folks, that was 20 souls that went into eternity. And regardless of where they were, they needed Christ. And um, you know what? Whether, whether, whether a person goes into hell having lived a homosexual lifestyle, rejecting Christ, or whether they lived a religious life never receiving Christ as their Savior, they still go into hell lost. And, and so we need to recognize I'm not downplaying the sin in any way, shape, or form, but I'm, let's, let's, be, let's be, be real about it. Twenty souls went into eternity. And I, I told my wife, I said, obviously there were things that were said. I mean, for instance, the, the, the couple of snippets of reports that I read, they made it very clear. Gay bar, gun. Gay bar, gun. And that was, that was, that was all that they just extremely emphasized. They actually said in one of the reports that, I mean, they're calling it an act of terrorism. This is, this is a personal thing, okay, when I say what I'm about to say. I don't get it when a guy or person, individual, goes into a gay bar and shoots up 20 people. It's called terrorism. But a fella from clearly an Islamic background goes on to one of our military posts and shoots a bunch of fellow soldiers, and it's workplace violence. I'm a little confused. You know, the problem we're running into is, is we're running into a world that is confusing. And, and, and it, it is a confusing situation. And um, really, the, the message this morning has nothing to do with any of these events, but I just something I felt like that I needed to just kind of point out. And I'd like to have a word of prayer for this situation, but also for our nation. And so let's just take a moment. Father, we, we come this morning, and Lord, at least 20 souls, 20 lives have ended on this earth, and 20 souls have gone into eternity. Lord, I do not know the salvation situation of any of these folks. And Lord, their lifestyle... Though wicked and wrong and sinful in your sight, Father does not give clear indication at this moment of time to where they stood in their relationship with you. I understand, Father, that if they continue to live that way and that there are judgment and, and the word of God is clear. But, Father, I ask and pray. I pray, Lord, for the souls and the lives of people that have been touched by this tragedy, that, Lord, that they would recognize that there is a need for Christ, and a need for hope. And Lord, regardless of the shooter's intention, whether it is somehow motivated by some distorted view of, of some religious view that would give him or this individual, the, in his mind, the right to go and take life this way. Lord, I pray that you'd help our nation. Lord, it is a confusing situation right now. But, Father, there is one sure answer, and that is that the Word of God has truth. And I pray that you'd help us. Help us, Lord, to seek your face, to seek your Word, to learn from it, and to, Lord, share it with others, I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are come to about with greatest, so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or endurance, the race that is set before us. Looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What I want to speak on this morning is the joy of missions. The joy of missions. Now, this is kind of, in some people's mind, this is an odd verse. Well, this is talking about Jesus is dead. Folks, I'm glad Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I'm going to rejoice in the cross, okay? I hope you will too, okay? 
Uh, I hope you'll rejoice in the cross because, first of all, recognize the cross did not end it all. The cross was just the, the, what, was what allowed Jesus to die. It was the resurrection that really completed it all. And so Jesus Christ did not just die. He rose again. And when we look at this verse in Hebrews chapter, one, or chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, notice he starts by saying in the first verse, wherefore. Now what he's looking back to, he's looking back to chapter 11. Now chapter 11 is God's hall of faith. Now I want to be mindful of something. There were other individuals who were faithful. There were a lot of folks in the Old Testament who were faithful that were named in the Old Testament, but are not named in Hebrews chapter 11. There have also been thousands, potentially millions of people down through the centuries that were faithful to God that have never been mentioned in any written history, let alone in Hebrews chapter 11. But for some reason, God saw fit to name specific individuals in Hebrews chapter 11. For instance, in chapter 11, verse 4, he mentions Abel. In verse 5, he mentions Enoch. He mentions in verse 7, he mentions Noah. In verse 8, Abraham. And then he goes on to talk about Sarah, and he talks again about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. And then he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives this hall of faith of individuals. And then in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he gives us the ultimate example of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, in other words, the folks in chapter 11, he says, let us lay aside every weight in the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And then notice that there's a comma there. Verse 2 is the conjunction with that. He says in verse 2, looking, how can we run the race with patience? By looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him. Now, I know that we look at the cross and we think it was a moment of defeat. Folks, the cross was not a moment of defeat. It was the beginning of victory. It was the fact that Jesus Christ, though he was dying, he knew what was to come. See, when they were driving the nails into Jesus' hands, Jesus knew in three days he was going to rise again. As they were whipping Jesus before they nailed him to the cross, as he's taking the beating, they thinking, we're beating him. He's thinking, in, in, in just a handful of days, I'm going to rise again. As they're gambling at the foot of his cross for his, his clothes and his garments and what few possessions that he had, and they're gambling and for these things, Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's saying things like, I thirst, and, and uh, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and Ela, Ela, lama sabachthani, it is finished. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ela, Ela, lama sabachthani, and then also it is finished. As he's saying all of these things, in his mind, he's going, in three days, I'm going to rise again. How many of you have ever gone through a horrific event knowing that on the other side, you had joy coming? This is a cheesy illustration, but it's just a perspective. This week, I was, I was uh, uh, putting, a, a, I had some screws, and I was using my screw gun, and I was holding the screw, and I was putting this, them in. It was, I wasn't pre-drilling the holes. I was using the screw to drill the holes in. And it, the, the head of the screw wobbled, and I was pushing on the drill. Len, you know, how many times have you done that, Len? Hey, oh, no, yeah, exactly. It, I drove the screw gun into my finger. And, and a pretty good chunk got taken out of it because I was pushing pretty You know what I'm talking about. Phillips head screw. So I, I've been wearing a bandage on it for a couple of days. Well, yesterday I got some liquid bandage. Have any of you ever used liquid bandage? There's antiseptic in it. And it said on the, on the label, it says antiseptic, and I thought, this is going to hurt. But I'm thinking in the back of my mind, you know what, this is going to hurt, but it will protect the opening better. And so, you know, I got a bullet out. I didn't get a bullet out. I took that stuff out and I started to put it on it. And at first I thought, that doesn't hurt. And then reality kicked in. And as the pain was throbbing in my fingers, I'm thinking, you know what? This is going to pass. This is going to pass and it's going to feel better. 
My dad's favorite line was, son, it'll feel better when it quits hurting. <laughs> and my dad was right. It always felt better after it quit hurting. Now, right now, it doesn't hurt. I can, feel my, I can feel my heart beating in my finger. If you want to know what my pulse is, I can tell you. Without you having to check it, I can just tell you. But it didn't hurt. See, I went through the momentary pain because I knew that on the other side, there was going to be some relief. Now, that is such a cheesy, small illustration of what Jesus Christ went through. Jesus Christ knew that he was going to suffer, that he was going to go through great pain and suffering. Why? Because there was joy on the other side. Now, this morning, here's the thing is, God has given to us. Do me a favor, turn to Mark chapter 16. I promise Eve, it's not that bad. And Dad's not even here to pinch him. Pinch her, sorry. Look at Mark chapter 16. He's giving to his disciples a commission. He's given to them. Now, you know the difference between a commission and a command? A commission is a responsibility given to a specific individual with a promise of a reward at the end. A command is something that has been given by an individual that you will regret not following. Okay? A commission sees a reward at the end. A command sees punishment at the end if you don't. That's why we call, in Mark 16, we call this the Great Commission. Because the Bible says that when we go and do what he says in these verses, God has promised that he will reward. Now, we'll talk about that maybe if we have time this morning. If not, we'll move on. But there's nowhere that this is said is the great command. But he's given to his disciples a commission. And he says in verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Okay, now everybody bear with me. I'm, I, there's a point I'm trying to make, so I need you to stay with me, okay? In Mark 16, 15, he says, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to who? Okay, now every creature. Notice he didn't say every person. He said every creature. Now that doesn't mean go preach to your dog. What it means is go preach to the people that you don't like. It means go, go preach the gospel to the people that if you had your way, you'd, if in your flesh, you let them die and go to hell in your flesh. What happened this morning in Orlando is a horrific thing. And there are some who are in the back of their mind, they're going, yeah, those gays, they deserve that. Folks, every single one of us deserves a place in hell. Every single person does. By God's grace, he's willing to redeem whosoever will. Now, yes, God has specific punishments for specific sins. I understand that. And God does have clearly a place that he does not, does not uh, shirk or look past horrific sins. But here he's given us the command to go to every creature. And he says in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In other words, already is condemned. And these signs shall follow them. And he goes on to say that they will cast out devils and they'll drink poison and be bitten by snakes. Of course, all those happen in the book of Acts, especially to the Apostle Paul. Now, here I say all this to understand this thing. This is the commission that God has given to us. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter 3 before we get to the heart of our message. There is joy when we fulfill that commission. When we fulfill the commission to go tell people about the saving grace of Jesus Christ, there is a joy. Notice, if you would, here in Acts chapter 3, first of all, there's the joy of seeing God heal the sick. You say, well, well wait a second. I didn't know this was a Pentecostal church. Folks, God still heals people. And if the Pentecostals are the only ones that, that understand that and believe that, some of us need to go back and read our Bibles. Now, I'm not saying that God heals every single person that seeks healing. But clearly, God does. And I want you to notice here in Acts chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, Now Peter and John went together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes on him, with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them. In other words, he looked at them, expecting to receive something of them. 
Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now I have a question. This lame man, do you think he would have preferred the silver instead? I don't think so. I don't think, I, I don't think he, if, 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 if he had said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll either heal you for, and so you can walk or I'll give you five bucks, which one do you want? Obviously, he wanted to be healed. And it says down in verse 7, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up and stood and walked and entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising. Can you imagine the shout and fit that was going on? Here you are in the temple, this nice, quiet place. Okay, picture, how many of you have ever been to a Catholic church service? Sometimes they're pretty quiet, aren't they? Can you imagine somebody in the back of the place going, Woohoo! Praise God! Glory! Hallelujah! I'm healed! The priest is going, Get that out of here! That's the visualization of what's going on. Do you think there was joy when this man got healed? Not only in him, but also in Peter and John. The other believers that were around, when they saw what Jesus Christ had done, there is joy in the healing. Now, I'll be honest, I've not seen it happen a lot of times in my life, but I've seen people that have been healed. You know what? I, again, I, this is something sometimes we don't talk about very often. Now, why? I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of explanations here. First of all, why did Jesus heal people? Well, let's look at the Bible. Look in Matthew chapter 8. Let's look at these real, real fast. Okay, why did Jesus heal people? Well, the Bible gives us actually five reasons why Jesus healed people. Look at Matthew chapter 8, beginning of verse 16. Matthew 8, 16, it says, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, or Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare sicknesses. One of the reasons why Jesus healed people was to fulfill the word of God, to fulfill the prophecies of God's word. Turn over to Mark chapter 2. Now, I could quote these for you, but I want you to see them, okay? Because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take God's word for it. Look at Mark chapter 2. Why did Jesus heal people? To fulfill prophecy. Number two, to show that he could forgive sins. Mark chapter 2 and verse 10. But ye, the, Back up to verse, actually, 8. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves... About, he, he, they, they thought he was speaking blasphemy because Jesus had said his, his sins were forgiven. He said unto them, Why reason ye therefore, or reason these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? Which is easier. But that ye may know that, that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house. Why did Jesus Christ heal people? Number one, to fulfill prophecy. Number two, to let people know that he had the authority to forgive sins. Then turn back to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. By the way, folks, God still heals people. God still heals people. But we, we, get, but we, need, to, we need to back up and, and look at Scripture, okay? Because God doesn't work outside the bounds of Scripture. Matthew chapter 11, look at verse 2. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, it says, Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art thou he that should uh, come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. Now what did they hear and see? The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whomsoever shall not be offended in me. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, look, go back and tell John that I'm the chosen one, and the reason you know I'm the chosen one, that he knows I'm the chosen one, is because I've healed the sick and I've raised the dead. 
So in other words, Jesus healed people, first of all, to fulfill prophecy, number two, to show that he could forgive sins, and number three, to prove that he was the Messiah, specifically to John, then, or to John the Baptist. Then turn back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. We're seeing why Jesus healed people. John chapter 9, look at verse 3. Neither hath this man sinned. Speaking of the blind man who was born blind. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Here's another reason why Jesus healed people. Jesus healed people so that the work of God could be seen in the healing process. And then one last one. Turn to John chapter 20. These are the five reasons why Jesus healed people. John chapter 20, look at verse 30. It says in John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these, in other words, these miracles, these things that you've seen, are written that ye, what? Jesus healed the sick to fulfill prophecy, to show that he could forgive sins, to show that he was the Messiah, to show the works of God, and so that we could believe. You say, okay, well, preacher, that's great for, for Jesus, but what about the disciples? Because in Acts chapter 3, it was the disciples who healed. Well, let's look at that. Turn back to Mark chapter 9. Jesus tells his disciples how they're going to... Wouldn't you like to have the ability to heal people? Oh, come on. Let's be honest. Wouldn't you like to have the ability to heal people? How many of you know somebody that's really, really sick, somebody that you love, somebody that you care about, and you would love to be able to go and heal them? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, Brother Finch, when your wife was still here, wouldn't it be wonderful to have been able to go to her and pray over her and heal her? <coughs> Not only did Jesus make people that were sick whole, he raised people from the dead. Every funeral Jesus went to, he busted it up. I'd love to be able to pray for people. And heal and see them heal. I love to be able to see that for their sake. Because I hate to see people suffer. Right? I hate to see people suffer. Especially people that I love. But I hate to see anybody suffer. I mean, good night. How many? Look, all these, these, these uh, you know, feed the children ministries from halfway around the world. They show you the picture of these malnourished children. There was a picture. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning picture of a little, a little African child that had walked for miles. They were malnourished, so malnourished that his great big belly from malnourishment. Skin and bones everywhere else, but just this great big bloating. And they were literally drooped over, dying. And ultimately, the child died. And the photographer took a picture. This happened just a handful of years ago. He took a picture of the child because in the background, on the ground, was a vulture. You know what, and, and, and you know, I've got to tell you the rest of the story. The photographer won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Well, that's great. He never helped the child. The child died. And after all the applause that he got from the Pulitzer, he couldn't take the pressure, and he took his own life. Because of the conviction of seeing an individual that he could have helped, he got accolades for a picture and didn't help the child. There are people out there that I would love to be able to help if I knew I had the ability. And Jesus told his disciples, look, I'm going to give you some power. I'm going to give you some authority to heal people. Look in Mark chapter 9, he says in verses 17 and 18. And one of the multitude answered and said, now, now I'm, I'm telling you this, they didn't heal everybody that came to them. I should have explained that first. They didn't heal everybody that came to them. And sometimes they, 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 they didn't have the authority that Jesus had. Because look in Mark 17, it says, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto them, unto thee, my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and gnasheth, or foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they what? They couldn't do it. Jesus then turns around and says, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Bring him unto me. 
He casts him out, and then he goes on to say, Howbeit this kind cometh forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. But the point of the matter is this. Even the disciples, even though they had been given power and authority, did not always have the authority and power to do everything. Folks, the work is not ours. Look, I don't care what these faith healers on television say. They cannot heal people. If anybody heals anybody, it's God. Now go back to Acts chapter 3 where we kind of started this, this whole thing. Because you see, why did the disciples, they were given authority to, to, to heal, though they didn't always heal everybody. Why did God give them this authority? Well, it tells us in Acts chapter 3, by example, beginning in verse 12 of Acts chapter 3, the layman is healed, and in verse 11 it says that, he, uh, he held on to Peter and, and John. All the people ran together on the porch. And in verse 12, wondering, they were wondering what was going on. In verse 12, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Why are you amazed at us? We had nothing to do with this. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised up from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And in his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brother, Brethren, I want that through ignorance ye did this, uh, as did also your rules. In other words, you crucified him ignorantly. Verse 18, but those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all his prophets, and Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and what? You know what, you know what Peter and John do? They take the opportunity that this, man, this man's gotten healed. They've gotten a crowd together as a result of the healing. You know what Peter and John say? You know what? Good time to preach the gospel. You're going to find that in the, New, or in the New Testament, whenever there was a healing done, every opportunity that the disciples could, they preached the gospel. They did not exalt the healing. They exalted Christ in the salvation work. Folks, my concern is I've seen too many faith healers that are exalting their ministry and not the gospel of Christ. If you read Peter and John's words, Peter and John are like, look, we are nothing. Don't you dare think I'm a faith healer. Peter says, look, Jesus is the one who does the healing. And while I'm at it, let me tell you who Jesus was. He's the Messiah you need to trust. You see, healing to the disciples was an open door to preach the gospel. Then turn back to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. And look at verse 12. The apostles were given the ability to heal, though they didn't heal everybody. They were given the authority and power to heal so that they could exalt Christ and preach the gospel, but it also showed their authority as apostles. Look at Acts chapter 15 and verse 12. It says, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. In other words, when they saw the miracles, they knew that Paul and Barnabas had authority and power from God. I truly believe that God still heals people today. Take your Bibles. Let me show that to you. James chapter 5. Now, I, I, I know I may be opening a bit of a, of a door here. We, from time to time, have prayed over individuals, and I'm not saying that we should necessarily do it on a on a daily basis, you know, other than if they are following Scripture. But I do think that we need to be mindful. If, if you have a health issue and you say, you know what, I've, I've, uh, we've prayed over some individuals. And, 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 and some individuals, God has seen fit to, to make them better. In some situations, God hasn't seen fit to make them better. 
Praying over somebody is not a foregone, they are going to be healed conclusion. There are those that say, well, if they weren't healed, then there was something wrong with the person. There was something wrong with a faith healer. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that at all. The Apostle Paul struggled with something physical his entire life. He asked the Lord to remove it from him. The Lord Jesus Christ himself died suffering on a cross. I'm not saying that God doesn't heal people, but I am saying that God still can. And he sometimes does that through the local church. In James chapter 5, look at verse 13, it says... Is there any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is there any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick? Verse 14, among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. It was a regular part of, this early, of these early churches that they would call for the elders of the church and pray for them. If you have, if you have an illness or infirmity that you want us to pray over, you let us know. We'll gladly do that. And can I ask you a question? If you saw God heal somebody, would you be happy? So in other words, now we go back to what started this whole message. See, that part of that mission that God gave us was to pray over people that were sick, to potentially see them healed. And you know what? To get to those people, it takes work, it takes labor, it takes effort. But there is joy, there is joy in seeing someone that is sick be healed. There is joy in that. And then second of all, turn to Acts chapter 19. These are shorter points, so don't panic. There's joy in seeing the bounds set free. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 11 it says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that with his body, so, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now, I heard there was a guy several years ago, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, and I won't mention his name because I, I, I may have his name not remembered correctly, but I'm pretty sure who this was. He prayed over handkerchiefs, and he said, send him 20 bucks, and he'll send you a handkerchief that'll heal you. Okay, does anybody notice in verse 11, there is some, there's a phrase in verse 11 that if you actually read your Bible, you wouldn't have sent Ernest Ainsley 20 bucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you see in verse, you see in verse 11, there's, this, there's a phrase? And God wrought what? By the hands of Paul. This idea of laying napkins and things on, somehow God gave to Paul some kind of a special blessing that, you know, oh, I've got it too. I, I, I struggle with that. But I will say this. If you've ever seen somebody demon-possessed, to see them set free. There was a, uh, up north, we had a young man that did not come to our church, but um, he was probably in his early teens. He started messing around with occultic things. Ouija board, things along that line. By the way, Ouija board's not a game. Ouija board's not a game. It's not a toy. If you have one, there's only one place that it's, that's, that it's good for. Kindling. But he started messing with the Ouija board. He started messing with some stuff. And ultimately, he actually invited a demon to come and live inside him. About 13, 14 years of age, he actually had a de he was He was demon-possessed. Everybody in the village was afraid of him. And I heard of a missionary who said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're, we're going to set this young man free. And he got together with the boy's parents. And they went up and they fasted and prayed. And I talked to a fellow who was actually at this. And by the way, it was not, they call it, exorcism is a Catholic term. That's not a biblical term. They cast out the demon. I saw pictures of the young man afterwards. The last that I heard, and this has been many years ago, and he was still a young man. 
he was actually feeling that God maybe had called him in to be a pastor. He had been set free. And I will tell you this, there was joy in his household when he was set free. Because when somebody is bound, whether it's by a demon here in Acts chapter 19, or some sin, as you'll find in Acts chapter 16 or Matthew chapter 15, where people are bound to sin, somebody who's, who's addicted to alcohol or drugs or some other addiction, and God sets them free. There's joy in seeing those people set free. There's joy in that. And so when it comes to this idea, well, what about missions is joyful? Well, seeing people set free from the bounds of their sin is joyful. There's also joy when God chooses to use just simply use earthen vessels. You know, God uses just common, ordinary, everyday people to do His work. You don't have to be a brain surgeon and have five degrees after your name for God to use you. Some of the greatest men and women of God never had any training or degrees. Let me show you. Turn back to 1 Corinthians just real quick to show you this one. See, there's joy. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says in verse 26, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the what? That means the simple things, the foolish things. That doesn't mean, you know, somebody with a, a weird hat on dancing around telling stupid jokes in front of a king. It means the simple things. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Isn't it interesting that some of the people that have the hardest time swallowing this book sometimes are the people who have more education? That see themselves as intelligent? The Bible talks about they made themselves, they thought themselves to be wise, and they actually became fools. And why does God do that? Well, it says in verse 27, God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God hath chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. D.L. Moody sold shoes. He was a shoe salesman. Some of the greatest men and women of God that God has ever used. Some that you'll know about, some that we'll never know about. You know what? God is, he's ready to use us. You say, I've got nothing to offer God. He's just who you're looking for. Because see, if you've got nothing to offer God, guess who he gets to fill you up with? With himself. With his power. With his authority. And you know what? When God does something miraculous, there's joy in that. There's, there's joy in that. There's joy when you look and say, you know what? God's chosen to use me. Or God's chosen to use that person. Or God's chosen to use per That's exciting to see. God used that person. There's joy in that. And then last of all, there's joy in knowing that your life counts. You see, there's joy in taking a tract and giving it to somebody. There's joy in pulling a, a tract out of your pocket and going, here, read this for me when you get a chance. Going past the girl at the cash register. You say, well, there's no joy in it. I'm afraid. Can I ask you a question? If that person takes that track and reads it and gets saved, was it worth you swallowing your fear? This is a track, actually, Brother Tennant sent me this. It says, how to get to heaven from Nebraska. I didn't know you could get to heaven from Nebraska. I started to write a track when we first moved here, how to get to heaven from Roman's nose. And then somebody, some smart aleck in the middle of the service said, Jump! <laughs> How do you get to heaven? You give a tract to somebody. I'll tell you something. If you've ever given a tract to an individual, when they take it, there's something inside of you that says there's a joy there. There's a joy there. 
There's joy in taking a track and giving it to somebody, leaving it someplace and praying that somebody will pick it up. There's joy in that. There's joy in handling scriptures. There's a joy in, in getting together and, and taking this section and this section and putting them together and putting them inside a cover and stapling them and trimming them and putting them in a box knowing that that John of Romans is going to go to a place that you'll never be able to go. There's a joy in that. There's a joy in being able to say, you know what, this representative of me gets to go where I can't go. There's joy in handling the Scriptures. There's joy in passing out tracts. And there's a joy in giving and working so that you can send missionaries to a field that you can... How many of you intend in your lifetime to be a missionary to the Hopi Indian Reserve in Arizona? How many of you intend in your lifetime to be a missionary to Arizona to the Hopi Indians? Okay, so you, you're not going to go, right? We, we can't go. If you've given to missions, let me read you about the fellow who's gone in your place. Pastor Foster in Valley Bible Baptist Church. It's been a long time since I have done a complete update. Every now and then I send updates, but I would like to receive all the latest information from everyone. If you support the ministry here, please email your physical address and so forth. He says, for as many of you know, I've been on furlough. It was a great visit. Some of my supporting churches and to visit some of my old friends. I was able to use this time to gather my thoughts and think about how better to minister here on Hopi. Although I am in the middle of sending out thank you cards, I want to thank everyone for everything they did for me. All the housing you provided, food, and tremendous love offerings. I was truly spoiled by churches and individuals. I have a terrible memory, so please forgive me if your individual thank you card does not get sent. Please know that every action and gift uh, I was deeply humbled by and your kindness did not go unrecognized. It is a privilege. It is a privilege for me to serve in your stead on Hopi. When I got to Hopi, back from furlough, a couple of things had happened. One good, one not so good. I've known for some time that the jail services would eventually come to an end because the building there had already been condemned. You think our jail in Scaharia was bad. For a long time, there have been, there have only been, uh, really, excuse me, for a long time, there have only ever been a few people in there. Upon arriving back at home, speaking about on the reserve, and going to the jail service, I was informed that they are no longer keeping inmates there, so jail service has ended. That was probably the biggest ministry opportunity we had had. Another door might be opening, though. The man who owns the house, which the church is located in, Kenny, is willing to sit in a children's church. He will just be present in the services, allowing me to do services while a second adult is present. It is supposed to be a permanent thing, so please pray for our new children's church. Upcoming events. We have the opportunity to take kids to that free summer camp again. Please pray that kids will want to go and great things will happen. Don't forget, we have our annual camp meeting at the end of July. If you are close enough, we would love to have you visit us during this time. Thank you for your monetary and prayer support. May God's grace be with you. Andy V. Magnarella, missionary to the Hopi Indians in Arizona. When you put money in the offering plate for a missionary... There's joy. There is joy in missions. There is joy when we see people healed. There's joy when we see people set free. There's joy when we get involved. And there's joy when we give so that others can go. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us to see the joy. Lord, there is a joy in seeing healing, and I would love to see healing take place. But there is also a joy when we get involved, when we hand out the gospel literature. When we take a track, Lord, I, I, I'm reminded of the, the Cantonese track that you allowed us to have come in a pack and here a few months ago taking it to the, to the folks at the Chinese restaurant. 
and asking if they could read it and seeing their face light up that they were handed something in their, national la- in their home language. Lord, there's joy in that. There's joy in giving so that missionaries like the Maluchis and Brother Magnarella can go and the, the Prangers and the Palmers. Lord, and the missionaries literally all throughout the world who go as our representatives to fulfill the Great Commission. Help us to see the joy and help us to participate in it, I pray in Jesus' name. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask this. Christian, are you joyful about sharing the gospel? I don't want you to take the tracts and hand them out as it was a burden, but as a joy. I don't want you to give to missions as a burden, but as a joy. There is joy in seeing these things take place. And so I pray that over the next year, you'll you'll commit to being involved personally in evangelism, missions work right here in our area, and then missions work around the world, praying for and giving to world evangelization. Now, if you're here this morning or you're listening to my voice and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would be amiss if I did not say right now, if you are not sure that heaven will be your home, we would love to show you what it means to be born again. Father, we ask your blessing now upon these thoughts. Help us to see the joy in the mission. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as the instrument begins to play with our heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment or two. If you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it would be our pleasure, our joy to show you from the Word of God what it means to be saved. If you're saved this morning, If God's put a burden in your heart for the lost around you, I encourage you, act upon that. Maybe you want to sit back down where you are. Maybe you want to come forward and kneel at the front row or at the, at the, uh, uh, the, the choir risers. But you do what God would have you to do. There is joy in the mission. Do you see that joy? Do you see that there is joy? There's joy in coming and handling the scriptures on Tuesday. I understand it's another night. So it's another night, preacher. Yeah, it's another night. I I understand that. But you're going to send representative in print around the world. How about the tracts? Handing the tracts out, wouldn't it be a joy to have to order more tracts regularly because we're just, we're passing them out. There is joy in giving. Sometimes they don't want it. I know that. And there's not joy in the rejection. But there is joy in the giving. There's joy in the mission.